for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so this talk is about the rationality problem for hypersurfaces and I want to consider this over an algebraically closed field little k. And then x in Pn plus one over k should be a smooth projective hypersurface. and d should be its degree. The question that we want to ask is, well, is this birational to projective space, so is x rational? Okay. So of course, if the degree is one, then x is projective space. If the degree is two, since k is algebraically closed, the it is a quadric with a point, so it's rational. On the other hand, if d is bigger or equal four, then no rational example is known. So since we know no example, one might expect that maybe starting from degree four, such hypersurfaces are never rational. But our knowledge is very poor on this question and we are far from understanding whether such an expectation would be true or not. So the first bound that we can easily give is that if D is bigger or equal N plus two, then the canonical bundle has some sections. And this is a birational invariant, so X is irrational. So if D is at least, if it's a bit big, bigger than the dimension, then, then X is irrational. And maybe another remark is that in dimension three, um, the problem, or in dimension less or equal three, the problem is essentially solved, at least over the complex numbers. And so I, I want to um, concentrate on the, the case where the dimension is at least four. Okay, so if the dimension is at least four, there are essentially three results that one should mention here. So the first result goes back to Iskowski Manin and then Puklikov and then in full generality due to Dufenet, published in 2006. <coughs> and it says the following so if x in Pn plus 1 over the complex numbers is smooth and the degree d is n plus 1, then x is not, um, no, it is. <laughs> X is <clears throat> birationally rigid, and this implies that X is not rational. So birationally rigid, for instance, implies that every birational self-map extends to an automorphism. Okay. And this uh, irrational variety has far more birational self-maps than automorphisms, so X cannot be rational. So the next result I want to present is due to Collard. And he also looks at hypersurfaces in projective space. But instead of asking that it's smooth, he asks that it's very general. Which of course is weaker. On the other hand, the degree can be much smaller. So the degree should be bigger or equal than two times n plus three over three. <coughs> and then his conclusion is that x is not ruled, 
which means that it is not birational to y times p1, and so x is not rational. And he proves this by degeneration to characteristic two, so his result holds over C and in fact also over directly closed fields of characteristic two. And that theorem uses MMP and resolution of singularities and so on, so it's really a characteristic zero result. So then a few years ago, Totaro combined this method of Kula with a method of Voisin to prove a slightly stronger statement. So again, very general. And the degree should be bigger or equal than two times n plus two over three, which is slightly smaller than this degree. So the three is replaced by two. And then the conclusion is also different. So x um, is not stably rational. So what that means is that even if you multiply with projective space, this is never rational. Okay. And yeah, I think in dimension at least four, these are all the results that have been known before. So looking at these degree bounds, it's natural to define the slope of x to be the degree of x over the dimension of x plus one. And then you see if the slope is bigger than one, that means that the degree is bigger than the dimension plus two. So we are in this simple case, where there are global sections, so x is irrational. If the slope is one, then we are in this Defenet situation. And in Kula Totaro's result, the slope is essentially bigger than two third. So the remark is that, well, this is the best result, so there is no um, irrational example with slope less or equal to third known. I think I make a mess here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so the goal is to, to improve this, this bound. And the theorem is as follows. So k should be uncountable, and the characteristic should not be two. And then if x in Pn plus one is a very general hypersurface of degree at least log two n plus two, then the conclusion is the same as in Totaro's result, so x is not stably rational. Okay, so there is also a version where k can be a smaller field like q or fp at joint t, but I don't want to want to state it. The uncountability condition uh -huh, is stably irrational, is not stably rational over the algebraic closure of k. Okay? Um, the uncountability here is just to ensure that there is a very general hypersurface. But if k is smaller, then you can still find some hypersurfaces that are irrational. So I don't want to concentrate on this. Um, right, so the first remark is that the slope of these guys is rather small because the 
So the, the first degree where this applies is this roundup of the log plus two, and if we divide by n plus one, this certainly goes to zero if n goes to infinity. So we, we find hypersurfaces of arbitrarily small slope that are irrational. That's the first remark. And then maybe the second one is what, what that bound says in explicit examples. So if n is four, then d has to be at least four. And Totaro's bound, which was the first, it was the best bound before, is exactly the same. So they just coincide. And starting dimension five, our bound is a bit better. And then the, the higher the dimension, of course, the better this bound becomes because the logarithm um, grows very slowly. And then, yeah, my favorite example is one million, so then the degree is 22. And here, we have some large number. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe I try again. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry. Okay, so in the remaining talk, I want to explain um, how, how to prove this theorem. And well, maybe before, before I do so, of course the, the small degree bound is, um, is pleasant, and the other pleasant thing is that it works in positive characteristic different from two, while totaro Colas method doesn't work in high characteristic compared to the dimension because they need to degenerate to a field of small characteristic to make their method work. So to explain the, the proof, I need to recall what an unramified cohomology is. So this already appeared in Olivier's talk, but I will choose to present a different, slightly more general description. Well, a different description. Um, okay, so x, uh, let's see. So k should again be algebraically closed, and x a variety over k and L a prime number different from the characteristic. And then I want to define the cohomology of the generic point of x, which I just denote by the cohomology of the function field. And this is either you can take for this the Galois cohomology of that field or in geometric terms the direct limit of the cohomology of all the open subsets that are non-empty. Okay, u in x is open, non-empty. We take the direct limit, so a class here is represented by a cohomology class on some open subset, and two such guys coincide if they coincide on a small open subset. And here, well, you can either take Betty or Ital depending on characteristic zero or not. So I don't write that. Um, now, this is obviously a rational invariant, but this is a huge thing. So even for P1, you, you get a huge group, right? So if you throw away points from P1, look at the limit on H1, this is a huge group. So this is not suitable. So we want to look at a subgroup in this huge group that is um, better to distinguish between rational and irrational varieties. Okay, so I hope that it's enough space. So definition of unramified cohomology. denoted by hi sub nr. Okay, and this is a subgroup of that group, so it's a class 
a cohomology class in some open subset of X with the following condition. So whenever we have a normal birational model, that it should be birational and Y normal of X and for all divisors on that model, there is an open subset which, which meets our divisor such that this class alpha actually comes from that open subset. Okay. So of course, X and Y are aberrational, so they have the same generic point. And then I'm just asking that this class alpha, which will be a cohomology class in the generic point here, so it's a cohomology class in that limit, in fact already comes from some V that meets my divisor. And this should be true for all the divisors. So that means that you have a, a class on some open subset, and whenever you have a device in the boundary, it extends over the generic point. <coughs> this does not imply that there is a global class, a global cohomology class. It only means that locally you can extend it. So if X is smooth projective, then this unramified cohomology can be described in the way Olivier described it. So this is just the global sections of some, it's a risky sheaf where this is the sheaf fification of the pre sheaf which takes its risky open subset to its cohomology. So that just says that if X is smooth projective, any class here will be represented by a bunch of cohomology classes and open subsets. The open subsets cover your space and on overlaps, the classes coincide. Okay, if you have this, then clearly you get, you get a class in this unramified cohomology because you can always pull back and it will extend and the converse is true as well. So another example is that if X is smooth projective, okay, so the first unramified cohomology is the same as the first cohomology. So the point here is that a first cohomology class cannot become zero if you pass to small open subsets, so it survives. For the second cohomology, of course, a, a divisor class will not survive here because it vanishes in this limit, and what survives is the L torsion in the Brouwer group. And then if the field, the complex numbers and X is rationally connected, then the H3 unramified yeah. is connected to the integral Hodge conjecture for co-dimension two cycles. So you take all the Hodge classes could I mention two and divide out the algebraic classes? Now by the Hodge conjecture, this quotient should be a torsion group. If X is rationally connected, then by bloch Srinivas, this is in fact a torsion group. Um, and we take the L torsion. Okay. So somehow the, the higher the degree, the more complicated it becomes to co compute these guys. Mm -hmm. And in, in particular, okay, and I'm, I'm sorry, so I should have said this before. 
So unramified cohomology was introduced by Kolyotidin and Ojan Koren in the subject. And by definition, this, this group only depends on the function field. But what they prove is that, in fact, it's a stable by rational invariant. This is not entirely obvious from the definition. So it doesn't change if you multiply your variety with Pn. So in particular, if you evaluate, if you look at unramified cohomology of Pn, it will be the same as unramified cohomology of the point. And that, of course, vanishes in positive degree. So in particular, if this unramified cohomology is non-zero for EI positive, then X is not stably rational. Unfortunately, we cannot compute this group directly for smooth hypersurfaces. So in, in all cases where people did that, where people tried to do it, whenever they were able to compute it, it vanished. Okay, sorry, so. Um, I have some problem with my lenses. So. Okay. So the strategy is we, we cannot hope to compute this group for a smooth protective hypersurface. At least current methods don't allow us to do so. So instead, we would like to compute it for some degeneration, for some specialization of a smooth hypersurface, so maybe for a singular one. And then would like to conclude something about X. So this is the specialization method, which goes back, um, yeah, the, the names I should mention here is Voisin, who used this for the first time, and then Koliotilin Perutka. And I will use my own version of, of, of that specialization method. And that's the following theorem. Um, So we look at a projective, a flat projective family, and C should be a smooth curve. Alternatively, C can also be the spectrum of a discrete valuation ring. And then X should be the very general fiber, respectively the geometric generic fiber is, if C is the spectrum of a valuation ring, and Y should be a special fiber over some special point of our curve. and everything happens over an algebraically closed field. So for instance, we could, we could look at a family of hypersurfaces where a very general one degenerates to a singular one. And then the assumption, the assumptions that we have is, the first one, this is an obstruction, so this is an O. Um, there is a non-trivial and ramified cohomology class on Y. Here I is at least, um, well, I is positive for some bigger zero. And the second assumption is that um, for some alteration, in an alteration, so in positive, char in, in characteristic zero, you can just take a resolution of singularities. And in positive characteristic, what you can do is, so this y prime will be smooth projective and tau generically finite. So if it was of degree one, you had a resolution, and well, this, this we don't know that it exists, but at least for generically finite, it exists. And the assumption 
is that L, our prime different from the characteristic, should not divide the degree. Okay, so such an alteration always exists actually by the Jung and Gaber. And the condition that we want is the following. So whenever there's a subvariety in that smooth guy which maps down to the single locus of Y, then the pullback of that obstruction class restricted to E is zero. Okay. So here we have this alpha which ensures that Y is irrational. Once you pull it back and restrict to any subvariety which maps down to the single locus, you want to get zero. And then the conclusion is um, that X is not stably rational. So in fact, X does not, if X is smooth, it doesn't admit that the composition of the diagonal. Well, in fact, also, also if it's single. Okay, so two remarks. So the first one is that Boisson and Kolyotelin Perotka proved a similar version if this vanishing condition is replaced by a condition in the Chow groups. So they ask that there is a resolution of singularities such that the Chow groups of the resolution in the singular guy are the same, the Chow groups of zero cycles. And in fact, this should be true after any extension of the base field. Now, this, my, my version has, has two advantages. So the first one is that this condition that I need is a purely cohomological condition, which is easier, in general, easier to check than a Chow theoretic condition. And as a consequence, this kind of condition to, to, to well, to make this work, it's enough to have an alteration, while in that kind of argument, you really need a resolution. And in, in positive characteristic, I, I don't know that my guys have a, have a resolution. Okay, so this is the first remark, and the second one is that, that, well, it's not enough to only have an obstruction, right? So there are rational varieties that degenerate to something that has, that is irrational, and that in fact has unramified cohomology. So just take a cubic surface which is rational and y a cone over an elliptic curve. Then the first cohomology, unramified cohomology of y is non-zero because it's the same as the first cohomology of any resolution, which is the first cohomology of the elliptic curve. Um, yeah, but neither this Chow theoretic condition nor the vanishing condition will be satisfied for this Y, so. So that, that's, that's what is V good for, somehow to rule out these kind of examples. Okay. So E is a sub-variety, so E should be reducible. So my, my subvariety is a uh, variety is, is irreducible, but it's just some subvariety. So if you, you can always assume that this is a simple normal crossing divisor, and then E can be a component. But if here I didn't assume this, 
and then E must be any subvariety. But I mean, this, the results of De Jong are strong enough to ensure that you can always assume that this is a simple normal crossing. So I want to give a, a vague outline of the proof first and then maybe explain a bit more details about one step later. So the step one is, okay, uh, oh no, I'm, I'm sorry, actually, I'm, I jumped ahead of myself. Now before, before I give an outline, a sketch of the proof, um, I want to mention how the examples where people computed unramified cohomology in that business, how they looked like usually. So the typical example Right, so at, at the end of the day we would like to apply the theorem, so we have to understand how can we come up with a, a, a single hypersurface that, ha that has unramified cohomology. So the typical example, which goes back to Artin Mumford in the 70s and then Julio Tillin, Oshan Guren and then others, then also Hasid Perutka and Schinkel, well, and, and many more. So they, they all, all had the same kind of shape. They all start off with a vibration into quadric, so a quadric bundle. And by this, I just mean that you have some morphism to, to some base, a projective space, such that the generic fiber is a smooth quadric. <coughs> um, over the function field of Pn. And then, um, they start with a cohomology class of degree n on the generic point of Pn with set mod 2 coefficients. Such that once you pull it back, it's unramified. So on Pn we cannot find non-trivial and ramified classes. So if you pick a non-zero class, it will be a cohomology class on some open subset and then typically there's a divisor at infinity where our class does not extend. But the idea is that if this is a set mod, if the class has set mod two coefficients, sometimes you can write down very special quadric bundles where the ramification in that quadric bundle eats up the ramification of your class so that if you pull it back, the class will be unramified there. And all these examples somehow are of this shape. And the, the crucial observation, which makes this version of the specialization method very useful in this situation is that whenever you have such a setup, This vanishing condition holds automatically for this class. So this is a, a, a general statement. So that, that says that whenever we produce unramified cohomology via such a construction, then we do not have to worry about V. And if we have a non-trivial class, we do not have to worry about O. So we the, the degeneration method just applies.
So I'm not really going to prove this, but I give you the idea by what is, what is going on in that example. So we need to take an alteration or a resolution, if you like, of our quadric bundle. And then we know that the generic fiber is smooth. It's a smooth quadric. So if we have a subvariety here such that um, it maps to the single locus, then the image in Pn will be of dimension less than n. Right. So it cannot be Pn because the single locus does not dominate Pn. So the simple case of the theorem, so we need to prove that if you pull back this, so we start with the class alpha here, we pull it back, it was unramified for some reason, we pull it back here, we want that it restricts to zero on E. So if alpha can be restricted to this D, then of course the pullback, if you pull back alpha from here, from here to there and then pull it back to y prime and then restrict it to E. This is the same as if you use this map G and you pull back the restriction of alpha to D. But then this vanishes because the nth cohomology of the generic point of D vanishes. And this is just because this group is a, you can write as a limit of cohomology of affine varieties, and an affine variety of dimension less than n has no cohomology in degree n. So this group is zero. So the only issue is that if alpha cannot be restricted to D, and of course there will be some, I mean alpha does not extend, it's not unramified here, so there will be some, some locus where it doesn't extend, and there, there you have to work. But that's, that's the idea why this might be true. Okay, now, now we are in the position to outline um, roughly the, the strategy. So we, we want to apply that theorem. So you start with a very general hypersurface of a certain degree and you just degenerate it to a hypersurface that now might be singular of the same degree and same dimension. And well, ideally our hypersurface should have a map to Pn. But now, of course, the hypersurface has Pika number one, so it will not have a map to Pn, but maybe some birational model, and this can easily be achieved. So the, the easiest choice is the following. So choose Y in Pn plus one of degree D bigger or equal to our bound is log two N plus two with multiplicity D minus two along some R plane, along some, some linear subspace in Pn plus one. So this is very singular. It has, it, it has multiplicity D minus two along a linear subspace. So if we project from that linear subspace, we get a map to Pn. Where, uh-huh, now I have too many ends. I'm sorry, so let's change this into a big N. Um, and now little n will be big N minus R. So this is just projection from P. And the generic fiber of this morphism the preimage of the generic point is a smooth quadric. You know, it will be of degree two because the multiplicity was d minus two while y had degree d. And you can always arrange that it will be smooth. So I want it to be smooth, smooth quadric. Okay, so in this step nothing happens. This is very easy.
And the advantage is that now this birational model, this explicit birational model of Y, has that map to PN. So we can hope that maybe the strategy that has already been used by Atten, Mumford, and others can also work. So step two, um, choose Y such that there is a class alpha on PN of degree N. such that three things are satisfied. So the first one is that it, once you pull it back, it should be unramified. The class should be non-zero. And the third condition, well, if, if we look at this theorem, we need to know that our obstruction class restricts to zero over the single locus. But now the single locus of Y and of the blow up is different. Because here we already resolved the, the, the single locus at the generic point of this plane P. So at that exceptional divisor, we need to ensure that our class restricts to zero. So explicitly, it has to restrict to zero where E is the exceptional divisor of that blow up. And this, in fact, is a tricky condition because that exceptional divisor is itself a quadric bundle over PN just of, of dimension one less. So we have a class that should be non-zero on this big quadric bundle, but on that smaller quadric bundle needs to be zero. Okay, and now there's enough space to write step three here. So somehow all the work is, is here. Step one and three are easy. So step three, you just finish once you have this. So by De Jong and Gaber, there is an alteration of this blow up of odd degree. And this uses that the characteristic is different from two. So you can find alterations whose degree is prime to any given set of numbers, finite set of numbers, as long as they do not um, contain the characteristic. Okay. So you can choose an alteration of odd degree. And then, of course, the composition will give an alteration also of odd degree because the blow up, the map from the blow up to y is by rational, it has degree one, still odd degree. Okay. And then um, we need to check condition O and V. So O holds um, by one and two. So we have an unramified class which is non-zero. So we need to check V, and this holds, well, three ensures that our class will restrict to zero um, on, on that exceptional component that comes from blowing up the, the, the plane in, in Y. And all the other components will have the property that they, 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 are, they in fact map down to singularities of this blow up, and that, then this theorem applies, where V holds automatically. So holds by three plus vanishing theorem. Okay, so that, that's the rough outline. So somehow the, the, the issue is, to find such a Y that has these three properties. And to construct Y is essentially equivalent to constructing the generic fiber of this map, which is just a quadric over the function field of PN. Now I've told you that people already constructed such examples, but if you look at all those examples in the literature, none of them will work. They all lead to hypersurfaces that have far too large degrees. So far larger than, than, than the dimension. So they, they are not in the fun range. 
So somehow we, we need a construction of such a quadric where this y has very, very small degree. That's, that's the issue. Well, that's one of the issues. Okay. Oh, no? Okay. Okay, so the last, I think, 15 minutes, less, um, I tried to say something about the construction of Y. So what we really need to do is we need to construct a quadric, a smooth quadric, <coughs> Q, Over, over that function field. And this will be the generic fiber of that blow up so that um, the corresponding hypersurface, and I will not write down it explicitly, but once you have the quadric, it's easy. And once you have the quadric in particular, you have the birational isomorphism type of Y because you have its function field. So that Y um, satisfies One, two, and three. Okay, so I need to tell you something about quadratic forms of a field. So big K denotes that field. And whenever you have a bunch of invertible elements in a field, you can associate to them two, two guys. So the first one is a class in the cohomology of that field, say with set mod two coefficients. And what is that class? Well, each AI gives a class in H in H one of that field which is just the units mod the squares. <coughs> and then you take the cup product of these classes to get something of degree n. So for such an error of invertible elements, we get a cohomology class. And we also get a quadratic form, the Pfister form. You note it like this. And this is, by definition, a tensor product of certain quadratic forms that have this shape. So this is a two-dimensional quadratic form that is diagonal with um, entries 1 and minus a1. And then you take the tensor product of all these things. And this is a form um, of dimension 2 to the n. So if, if you write this down, this will look like this. So minus a1, minus a n, then plus a1, a2, and so on, and then a1. Well, up to a sign minus 1 to the n, a1 to a n. So that diagonally, that, that form, all the entries are all the possible products of your AIs and a 1 in front. Okay. And that form has dimension 2 to the n, and that's where at the end of the day the log 2 will come from. Now, these two things are, are closely related. Ah. Okay. 
Okay, so this is a theorem in quadratic forms that is due to many people, and then at the end of the day, it uses um, the Milner conjectures, so also uses Wawotsky's work. And it says the following. So if alpha, this, this cohomology class is non-zero, then, I'm sorry, so I should write um, F, some smooth quadric. So I want to start off with a smooth quadric, big Q, uh, smooth projective quadric over that field, big K. That, that's the starting point. And what I want to understand is when I start with a cohomology class on that field, <clears throat> so on the generic point of Pn, say, when is the pullback to the quadric zero? That's what I want to understand. So I start with a class that is non-zero, and then the assertion is that the pullback is zero, if and only if this Q can be written as the zero set of a quadratic form, which is a subform of this twister form. So understanding whether our cohomology class vanishes is the same as understanding whether the quadratic form is a subform in here. So for, for the construction, I want to fix these AIs and then try to find the correct Y or the correct quadric so that the pullback will be unramified. So I use the simplest elements in, in the function field of Pn and that's just the coordinate Xi where big K that field. And then the quad, quadric Q will be defined like this. So there is a one-dimensional piece and then orthogonal sum with some other quadric Q prime such that One orthogonal sum with Q prime is a subform of this Pfister form. Okay. And G will be some element, some rational function on Pn. Okay, so our at the end of the day, our quad quadric will exactly look like this. So it will be given by such a quadratic form, which is very close to being a Pfister form. All I changed is, the cha I changed the one here. I changed the one here by some g. Um, okay. So here is the following example, which is a, an application of that theorem. So if, and in fact this application does not use Wawatsky, so this is the easy direction. So if G is a square, <coughs> then this pullback will be zero, right? So if G is a square, then my quadratic form Q, I can replace the G by a one, and then, um, by definition of this Q prime, Q will be a subform of the Pfister form, and then that theorem says that the pullback is zero. So this is 
Is this clear? So at the end of the day, we would like that this is not zero, so we better do not choose g as a, as, as a square. So we define g as follows. So it will be t times big g squared plus x1 dot dot, dot xn, where g is a polynomial Um, general of degree, okay, so I don't know, something like n plus one half round up, something like this. And this t in k is a parameter. So it is transcendental over the prime field. Okay, and then the claim is that if we choose y, so that Q, the generic fiber, um, so this quadric that, that appears in the construction is generic fiber of the blow up of the, this p, um, blow up of y along p, so that the generic fiber is given by Q, with Q as in the definition, and then f upper star of alpha in Hn um, or say differently, alpha in H and K n satisfies one, two, and three of step two. That's exactly what we what we needed. So let me let me explain maybe two first. So two was the, the assertion that if you pull this back, this is non-zero. Okay, so you see from the construction, g is not a square, but this is not enough to conclude that it's non-zero because you would need to prove that this quadratic form Q is not a subform of that Twister form, and in general, this seems like a hard problem. So I don't know how to do this in, without a trick. And the trick is this T. So I use a further degeneration where my parameter goes to zero. Then uh -huh, I, I do this generation and I assume from the beginning that x1 product xn, so this one dimensional quadratic form, lies in q prime. I can do this because that product appears in the, in the Pfister form, right? So I, I can assume that this, this one dimensional form is a subform here. Now, if we degenerate t equal to zero, then g degenerates to x1 dot dot xn, and so q, which was g orthogonal sum with q prime, becomes isotropic because q prime has the subform, and so you find a two-dimensional subform that, that looks like one comma one, but we are over an algebraically closed field so that will have a point. So this um, isotropic. So the whole situation degenerates to something that is rational, but then the pullback is, is um, injective. So the pullback is injective if Q is rational. And so the specialization of that class is non-zero, and so it was non-zero to begin with. So this proves two. Okay, so I'm, I'm out of time, so I just say in words how to prove one. And in fact, well, to prove one is more work, but the, the idea of one, so idea of one. So this class alpha, Um, is unramified away from 
the hyperplanes. So this really is represented by an honest cohomology class on the complement of all the coordinate hyperplanes. Now we have this, this quadric, we, we extend it to a quadric bundle and we would like that the pullback now extends, you know, downstairs. You have these hyperplanes and upstairs you would like that it extends there. But it's a locally over such a hyperplane, my G becomes a square. Okay, so K was algebraically closed, so I could also write T square here. So this term is a square, and that disappears. So by Hansel's lemma, it locally, this becomes a square, so in the completion of that local ring. So it locally over this, G is a square. But then look, let's look at the example. So if G is a square, then the pullback is zero. So that means that my class is actually it locally zero, so I can just extend it trivially. Okay, um, yeah, so I should say that, that this construction, um, generalizes an example of a quadric surface over P2 of Hasset, Kirke, and Schinkel. So they, they write this down differently, but for, for a different choice of this little g, somehow one would get back their example, and this was and part of the motivation how to how to find this generalization. So I'm, I'm done, thanks.